Good evening, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Fresh Start. It is uh, a Bible study of Southeast Seventh-day Adventist Church in Cleveland, Ohio. And we're so glad that you have tuned in with us, whether you are with us live or watching the replay. Uh, we do this every Tuesday evening, 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. You can find us at se, the number seven, uh, the word day, dot org, uh, or just search Southeast Seven-Day Adventist or Southeast SDA in Cleveland, Ohio, and you will find us on most social media platforms. Tonight, we're doing Revelation Seminars, lesson number nine, the four horsemen of Revelation. Let's have a word of prayer, and we're going to get right down to it. Father, thank you for uh, your word. We thank you for your promise that you would be present if two or three of us are gathered together in the midst, whether we're studying or praying, you promised your spirit. So Lord, we invoke your Holy Spirit right now to be with us and to lead and guide us into all truth is our prayer in Jesus name. Amen. Amen. All right. Well, normally I ask somebody else to read, but I'm doing it tonight just so we can keep the flow. I hope y'all don't mind. So let's get going. The four horsemen, if you can mute yourself out, please. The four horsemen are part of the seven seals of Revelation, chapter six and eight. Uh, these seals are seven symbolic events which face the people of God. From the ascension of Jesus until his second coming, they cover the same time period as the seven churches of Revelation in chapters two and three. So now, uh, we have been, uh, everything has been pretty simple so far. And now it gets a little bit more complicated, but we don't have to be intimidated by all of it, any of it. All we have to do is kind of take the scripture as it comes, and then we can verify text uh, here a little and there a little. And that's exactly what we're going to do. So it's some basic things that we need to remember. Remember, that the proper way to view prophecy is historicism, meaning that um, these things have chronological time periods uh, and they use symbols and sometimes just outright dates and numbers to help us figure out where we are in time. And as you know, uh, Daniel and Revelation are complementary books to one another. And so, uh, so the revelation is heavy with symbols, but uh, we can decode those symbols with the rest of the Bible. In many cases, we can do it uh, with uh, the book of Daniel and also with the words of Jesus himself. And one thing we know for sure is that the Bible is never going to contradict itself. So when God is telling us something in the book of Revelation, it's not going to go against what he said anywhere else. And it, 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 we must say this again and again, that if you are in a church that completely dismisses the Old Testament, then it's very easy to go astray in your doctrine in the New Testament. The Old Testament is foundational. Yes, Jesus died on the cross, and those things that uh, uh, that lead up, that foreshadow what the Lamb of God would do for us for all eternity, those things are done away with. But those, that's a very small bit of the Old Testament. You know, uh, when it comes to prophecy, when it comes to God's character, when it comes to his commandments, all those things are forever. And God himself says it over and over and over again. And so when we look at these Four Horsemen, uh, people have made a lot of movies and, uh, you know, told stories about it, made a lot of assumptions, and and uh, we don't need to do any of that. All we have to do is read God's word. So, so let's go on. We're talking about the seven seals, and this is how the Four Horsemen are revealed. So the, sim the symbols explain, number one, what do horses and riders represent in prophecy? Zechariah 1, 8 through 10 gives us the answer. 
These are they whom the Lord has sent to walk to and fro through the earth. All right. Zechariah 6, verses 2 through 5. These are the four spirits of heavens, which go forth from standing before the Lord of all the earth. Okay. Now that doesn't uh, shed a whole bunch of light on it right away. But uh, but again, we have to lay some foundation and then we go from there. So horses and riders in general, in prophecy, are on the move. And anything on the move deals with time. Okay, let me say that again. Anything that is moving is dealing with time when it comes to prophecy. So whatever these individual horsemen represent, they, they refer to something that takes place over a period of time. And each horse represents, a, each horseman represents a period of time. So let's go further. Uh, Hebrews 1 verses 13 and 14 states plainly that angels are ministering spirits sent by God to minister to his people upon the earth. These spirits are angels which ministered over four very important, see that, time periods and special events that God's people must pass through. Okay, so we got four specific time periods that God's people must pass through, beginning with the New Testament church. So now we have our starting point. Okay, our starting point of the four horsemen of the apocalypse begins with the apostolic church. Okay, number two, who announced the four myster mysterious horsemen? Revelation 6, 1, 3, 5, and 7. Answer, the four beasts. These are called four living creatures. In some translations, they have special responsibilities in heaven. Now, if you recall, and we, you know, we're nowhere near finishing Revelation, so you don't have to get worried. But if you recall, there are four beasts or four creatures uh, around the throne of God. And uh, so that is what, uh, that's who's making these announcements about these seals being open and the four riders or four time periods. Okay, number three, the seven seals. Okay, I, I'm going to stop in just a second and make sure everybody's still with me, but I'm just trying to get to a certain point. Number three, how is the rider of the white horse described? So this is the first horseman. It is the white horse. Revelation 6, 2. He that sat on him had a bow and a crown was given unto him and he went forth conquering to conquer. Okay, and so... Uh, so the very first horseman begins with the apostolic church. Now, when did that begin? Remember in, in uh, Acts chapter one, uh, uh, they, they tarried a while and waited for the Holy Spirit. And when the Holy Spirit came upon them, what did uh, Jesus followers do when the Holy Spirit came upon them? Can anybody help me with that? Anyone? All right, I see a hand there. Thank you, Elder Parker. Go ahead. They were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to preach the gospel. Yes. Yes, they were. And, and you stay right there. Because let's talk about what's significant about that. Before uh, Jesus' ascension into heaven, he told, gave them the Great Commission, right? To go right. into all the world and do what? Preach, preach the, gospel. the gospel. But then at Pentecost, the world came to them. Amen. Uh, and so as a result of the apostles preaching the gospel, what happened? The word got spread and it went out into all the nations that were there. And it was a numerous amount of nations who were uh, named at that particular time. And they went back and spread the gospel into the country that they came from. Yes, but before they even left, some remarkable things happened, right? Yes, sir. <laughs> there was healing. There was miracles performed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Amen. Sister Hood, you want to jump in on this? 
yet they spoke in uh, a language that everyone present could understand. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In reference to because of the multitude of people, like you say, the people came to them. And because the people were from all parts of the known world at the time, they had different, um, they spoke different languages so they could all hear what was being said in their native tongue. Yes, yes, yes. And, and, it, and, and it's, it's important to note that they weren't trying to speak in anybody else's language. They were just preaching and the Holy Spirit caused the hearers to hear in their own language. Okay. Uh, Sister Audrey, go right ahead. Thousands, thousands joined the church. Yes, yes, indeed. Yes, people were ready and the Holy Spirit came upon them and they felt the message and joined. So how often did those thousands join? It was daily. Yes, daily. Daily. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Sister Diane. I was going to say what Sister Audrey was saying is that the church was going forth. It was um, it was beginning. It was evolved. It was just um, and they, and they were finding out all the prophetic um, messages in the past in the Bible were true. They mm -hmm. God revealed many things to them <laughs> that day. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much. Well, uh, oh, Sister Parker, go ahead. You know, listening, Pastor, to what everything everybody was said, will the revival that is spoken of in the in the Bible before the return of Jesus would that be similar to the revival back then or greater? Uh, it certainly will be similar. Uh, you know, uh, it it has to be, uh, be, it, it be it, because uh, really the circumstances in which the gospel first went forth are born to be recreated. You know, the world in turmoil, uh, one world government and all the things that come with that. All right, so uh, in this particular situation with the first horseman, the reason that the horse is white is because the gospel is pure. You have people who Jesus personally taught, they were eyewitnesses, preaching what the Holy Spirit gave them directly in that moment. So there is no filter. This is why the horse is white, because it is the pure gospel. You can't get any closer to it coming from God than Jesus preaching it himself. Everybody understand why the horse is white? Amen. All right. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Let's see. This is a long one. So let me keep going. No, note what a fitting symbol for the church of the first century. So successfully was God's church that before Paul died, he said that the gospel had been preached to the entire world. Wow. <laughs> uh, Colossians 1, 5, verse 6, and verse 23. White symbolizes the purity of the church. Psalm 51, verse 7, Isaiah 1, and verse 18. And again, you can always pause the video and look these up or write them down so that you can do further study. We want you to not just listen to us on the panel talking. We want you to go and read. All right. So let's move on to the red horse. Oh, that's an ugly rascal right there. Let's see what he's doing. <laughs> right what did the rider of the red horse do revelation 6 and verse 4 what did the rider of the red horse do power was given unto him to take peace from the earth and they should kill one another well that's not good right <laughs> that is not good so uh god spreads the pure gospel and the devil retaliates. That's what it looks like to me. The devil is retaliating. Okay, note the red horse under the second seal represents the Romans government's bloody persecution of the people of God during the second, third, and early part of the fourth centuries AD. 
the same period of time covered by the Smyrna church. God uses the color red to depict war, slaughter, and bloodshed. See Ezra 32, verse 6 and 11, Jeremiah 46, verse 10, and Nahum chapter 2, verse 3. So everybody understand why the second horse is red. Yes, sir. Thank you, Elder Parker. I appreciate that. <laughs> All right. Yes, Pastor. We understand. <laughs> All right. Just hey, you know, I'm in I'm in school classroom mode. Number five. Why did God use a black horse under the third seal? Acts chapter 26 and verse 18 from darkness to light john 12 verse 35 walk while you have the light lest darkness come upon you now before we get to the note just asking uh if someone can put this together why is the third rider or the, the third rider on a black horse Anybody? Oh, it's El Elder Parker. Go right ahead. The writer is on the black horse because that is a time of darkness. There's famine in the land. There's hunger. There's distress. And darkness is there because that is probably during the time of the French Revolution. Mm -hmm. All right, boy, I see a lot of hands on this one. Sister Parker, go ahead. I was going to pretty much say the same thing. He represents famine. And, now, and I was going to put it as today, as, the, as we're going into doing the tribulations, we're going to have a great famine in the land. And if you look at that man, he's on a horse. Look how he looks. He looks pitiful. Mm -hmm. He got a scale, a balance. And uh, he's there. And he's, nothing is not balancing out because nothing is there. There's famine in the land. He can't get it to, you know, come to a place where it could be uh, balanced to, and to be in a safe place. But they, like it was said, it's, it was famine and, and to, to no extent was no food, was no nothing. And it's going to be in the near future for us. And that's something for us to look at, mm -hmm. you know, and get ourselves, I would say, ready for. Mm -hmm. Amen. Amen. Elder Hood, go right ahead. Well, I think about the opposite of the white horse representation mm -hmm. and the gospel was pure. And here the gospel is no longer a pure message. And so deciding, you know, it, 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 well, just based on the text, I'm to walk while you have the light. So just the, yeah, the word itself, the gospel message has been tainted, you know, um, uh, in reference to today. So just bringing it up to, to, to till today. And even during biblical times, they began to worship idols. They began to worship false God, false doctrine, and all that began to creep into the church. And so here we are today in a dark place when it comes to truth. And so, you know, while we as a people have truth, we need to take mm -hmm. advantage of the uh, Tuesday um uh, study the master class the Wednesday night you know so forth and so on so that's what I think about excellent yes ma'am that is absolutely true sister Diane go ahead I'm thinking the same thing it's like people who are rejecting the light and holding on to darkness you know yeah. and they're, they're compromising and they're they're looking to man to understand God versus looking to God to understand God and, you know and then they compromise and you know and and they compromise the word to a point where um, the doctrine, just like um, um, Sister Hood was saying, is that the doctrine is being compromised, um, you know, and maybe, maybe they're, I don't know, uh, you know, maybe there's a Sunday worship thing going on, too. I don't know. I, I'm just wondering if it was. It absolutely is. Uh, yeah, or something like that. Mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I'm just not saying anything because I want to let everybody else talk. <laughs> but you, you, you're absolutely right. They're forsaking the covenant. <laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Sister Diane. Sister Audrey, go ahead. 
I look at this as during the dark ages when God's word was taken from their people. Yeah. They weren't allowed to read the word. They yeah. were told what it was saying. They put, and they didn't keep it in a language that they understood. And so therefore they were able to lead the people into darkness away from God's word, away from the truth. So as uh, Sister uh, Hood was saying, from darkness, from the white horse to the black horse, it was just the opposite. A lot of error went in. And again, uh, pity back on what others were saying about God's true word, the Sabbath, the Sunday was brought in there, Sunday keeping and what have you. So uh, that's when I look at uh, the black horse during um, the dark ages when people weren't allowed to uh, understand God's word. It was hidden from them. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. And um, even to the point where people rejected the royals, they rejected the church, and they start to turn towards science altogether. So you had two groups. You had people who were superstitious. They had all those different beliefs synthesized together because they didn't have the word. And then you had people who were bitter because of all the, de the de devilment the church had done. Uh, the Catholic church had done so much evil to people uh, that they attributed all to be God's fault. And so there was a total rejection of the word. So there's no light, meaning there is, there is darkness. There is darkness. We're going to explain it more. You know, this is a, this is a, a, a long journey with Revelation Seminar. So we're just making one wave, one pass through to kind of get it. And we always double back and pack some meat on the bones. Okay. So, so let's go just a tad bit further. Here's the note, spiritual darkness. Yeah, so yeah, I guess you're right, Elderhood. Or blackness is sin, apostasy and error, the very opposite of the light of the gospel, meaning the white horse. The church during the fourth, fifth, and first part of the sixth century became popular, worldly, and finally very corrupt when church and state united. The black horse represents the same eras as the Pergamos. I think somebody said that. I thought I heard somebody say that. The Pergamos church, a time when millions of pagans with their false practices and teachings came into the church. This resulted in the persecution represented by the sword of true Bible-believing Christians. So it's a very sad time. And there's no way this wouldn't have would have happened without the red horse that preceded it. So if we just retract a little bit, uh, it began the gospel began pure. The people Jesus taught himself, the 120, uh, were uh, you got your camera on, Elder Gene? <laughs> yeah. So the people who uh, uh, were taught directly by Jesus, received an outpouring of the Holy Spirit, and they preach what Jesus taught them. And then, as a result of that, the Roman the Ro Roman Catholicism persecuted those people, and 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 uh, those who did not die were forced to yield. Those bishops yielded, and they accepted the conditions that the Roman Church put on them through Constantine. And those conditions were to water down the gospel and receive all other kinds of practices into it. And so uh, so then you have a synthesis, a, a corrupt church, and it leads them into an era of darkness. OK, so uh, so these horsemen, as spooky as they look, we're actually having some understanding. What did the black horse rider have in his hand. Revelation 6, 5 and 6, he has a pair of balances. And uh, Sister Parker so noted all these depictions of the rider of the black horse uh, shows a person depleted. That person is is suffering. And, 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 and then the church itself is suffering. So let's go on. Note the balances represent the union of church and state. When Christianity became the official religion of the Roman Empire under Constantine, a picture is given of food being weighed, 
during a terrible famine, the famine symbolizes an acute scarcity of the word of God. Amos chapter 8, verses 11 and 12. Now there's all these moral battles taking place in U.S. courts. And what does lady justice look like in front of U.S. courthouses? What is a description of how lady justice looks? Somebody, if you can't remember, look it up right quick. Uh, Elder Parker. She's blindfolded with scales. Mm. Mm. <laughs> and now what an image that is, isn't it? She's Amen. blindfolded Blind. with scales. You know, what is the significance of that when it comes to Christians trying to operate in a secular world? What does that mean? To me, that means that the truth is not going to come out because mm. it's blinded. It's, it's, and with the scales, it represents, it's supposed to be even, you know, it's not supposed to be anything that's, that, that, um, ways as the bible said in, in to the uh 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 leaders of the church not supposed to uh uh unbalance the scales in other words put, put some weight in there to make it look like it's going to level off in one way or the other that means mm -hmm. that to the to, for the church that that uh statue represents that you're not going to get a fair shake because hey i'm blinded by the blindfold so that means that when it comes down to truth and justice it's not going to be balanced out anyway mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that's the way i see it anyway yeah well if you ask them they'll tell you the blindfold means that justice is impartial that they're not going to take into account who the person is but they're just going to hear the facts but i don't know if that's how it went no <laughs> not from the government <laughs> <laughs> all right sister hood go ahead uh, could it be that there's no loyalty to either side? Yeah, well, that's possible. That's possible. Uh, and it's also possible that the government sits in the seat of God. That, that I have, that they feel they have the right to legislate both secular and religious issues. Because the scales represent both things, right? Church and faith. The reason I say that is because just, and of course, I'm no history buff or I'm into mm -hmm. as much, but just listening to the, um, the, the study after this study, I can't even, the secret terrorists, mm -hmm. and just listening to that philosophy in, in, in that, you know, it's not really the government or the church is those who have the money. So yeah. is it, so that's why I think along the lines of there's no loyalty on either side. It's the person. play both sides. Yeah. 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 Well, that's certainly true. That's certainly true. Uh, all right. Okay. So let's, let's go on. This one is a little longer. Uh, if you're unmuted, please mute yourself. We could hear you. Uh, when you're doing things. Oh, man, it just got black. Now, I'm just kidding. I made the slides. <laughs> Martyrs for Jesus, number seven. Who rode the pale horse and what followed? Revelation 6 and verse 8. His name was Death and Hell followed him. Wow. Anybody know why this horse is pale? Okay. Nobody wants to take a stab at it. I'll just go on to the next slide. Oh, wait a minute. Somebody do it, does. Elder Jean. Go right ahead, Elder. Elder Jean, go ahead. Could it be, I'm just taking a stab at it. Could it mm -hmm. be that because it's neither completely dark nor is it completely pure, so it's kind of in between? Mm -hmm. Yeah, 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 that's certainly some truth to that, for sure. All right, I would say more, but I don't want to steal it from all the people lined up behind you. <laughs> you know, so, so yes, that's, yeah. yeah, I would say yes to that. All right, Sister Diane. 
Well, it's a little off the white horse and it's a little of the dark horse. So <laughs> it's kind of like um, uh, not quite, it's maybe it's a lukewarmish sort of thing going on there um, mm -hmm. or going on two sides. Um, I'm not quite sure. Some giving doubt. I'm, it's not solid. It's yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> I, oh, tried. Okay. I tried. <laughs> no, you did good. This is uh, I, I just can't. I'm not saying anything because I don't want to give it away while people are waiting right with a hand raised. Okay. So, so nobody, you haven't been wrong, <laughs> but uh, there's more to it. Sister so Parker, go ahead. You know, I would say the horse, he represented, well, I think the horse, he represented life, but uh, death rode on life. And this is what the, the, the Lord is saying, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God through Christ Jesus is eternal life. So it's giving uh, mankind a choice, which choose ye this day, uh, whom ye go serve, because the white horse, look at, he's beautiful. He's, he's he look at look at look at his muscles how strong those muscles are are <laughs> in those legs and stuff and look at death so pale so mm -hmm. so pitiful so 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 disgusting deceiving mm -hmm. yeah you getting that, it all y'all got real close but you hadn't quite hit it okay uh, but remember remember that these writers represents time periods okay uh, Elder Parker, go ahead. Elder Parker? I was going to say that the pale horse represents in between. You're not hot, you're not cold. No, oh, yeah, yeah. And death and hell, death and hell follow him. And when you're not hot, you're not cold. When you die and you're not and you're lukewarm and Christ and Christ spew you out of his mouth, you burn up, you're going to hell. Hmm. So I would say it represents the lukewarmness. You're not hot, you're not cold, you're in between. And I leave it like that. <laughs> All right. Thank you, sir. Uh so far, y'all pretty much said the same thing. Elder King Man, go ahead. I mean, Brother King Man, go ahead. <laughs> I accept the elder. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, the difference with the pale horse and the rider being black is that anyone that this this appearance rides up on, they know they, they know they get ready to get struck down without mm -hmm. any confusion at all. They be like, "Oh my God, for what I've done, I know I should have straightened up long before now." And mm -hmm. that's uh, basically the symbolic to the has to me. It doesn't represent life. It, definitely rep represents the darkness of death that the eternal death the second death that you're gonna have to deal with the fiery furnace mm -hmm. amen 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 all right sister diane go ahead well since the last horse had something to do with sunday worshiping on sunday why maybe this horse is distorting the death doctrine because it's he it was his name was death and hell followed him. So now it's going to distort what's going to happen. From death, there's a hell, eternal damnation. Um, another shot of it. All right. Thank you so much. I appreciate it, Sister Audrey. Would you say that this is the Laodicean time period of the church? Yes, yes it is. And so, therefore, uh, it's like what some were saying the the message but they have they're not accepting it because they are not accepting the the message so therefore they are going to die that is that is uh the decision it says the wages of sin is death and so therefore they're not accepting the gospel where they feel that they have it all during this time period so therefore, uh, the decision is the death decree of the yeah. wicked. Yeah, I find it so interesting that um, the names that these new churches give themselves, when this is right here in the Bible, talking about the time we live in, for, for, uh, you know, like the emerging church, 
the new evangelicals, the younger evangelicals. Um, uh, they they give themselves names that sounds like there's been a re revised version of the gospel, one that's easier to digest. Uh, this pale horse is the last day church, not the remnant, but the last day church. The pale horse with its rider, death, followed by the grave, Hades in Greek, symbolizes the millions of God's people destroyed by sword, starvation, wild beasts, and other cruel methods of torture and killing. This period is covered uh, by Thyatira Church from the 6th through the 15th centuries, known as the Dark Ages. And so this is interesting. I want to put that picture back up. You have someone saying that they are the church, but the church, instead of giving life, is actually persecuting people. Make sense now? Amen. Okay. So this particular version of the church, um, you think Daniel now, all right? And Daniel, you had, he had two visions. One was the interpretation of Nebuchadnezzar's. There was four great kingdoms, right? And that last one had to be destroyed by a stone without hands at the feet. But before the stone without hand comes, there's this all these broken up pieces in the bottom and the feet, right? Then he had another vision. Daniel had his own dream of four great beasts. You see the number four coming back again. And each, the, 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 the statue by Nebuchadnezzar, the man with the different medals, he represented Nebuchadnezzar until the end of time. The four great beasts represented the same thing. They represented four great kingdoms beginning from the time he was in to the end of time. And then the seven churches represented the apostolic age until the end of time. So the four horsemen being unleashed during the opening of the seven seals, they go, you know, you already know the start point, but they go until the hand without stones or the lamb of God comes and stops it. So the last rider we're given is a pale horse. And that's interesting because he's an imitation white horse. A pale horse looks white until you get up close. From a distance, a pale horse looks like a white horse. But you have to examine it to find out its authenticity. Is everybody with me yet? And so this is why we are encouraged to study and to pray and to know God for ourselves because a pale horse, as Sister Parker said, is beautiful, just like a white horse. Sister Diane, go right ahead. So it's a counterfeit. Yes. Okay. Yeah. 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 Yeah, it is a counterfeit. Let's go further. Now, instead of the government persecuting Bible-believing Christians, it was the church. Remember with the red horse, it was Rome. It was the political Rome. It was the government of Rome. But by the time we get to the pale horse, and, and actually it, it started with the black horse, to be honest with you, <laughs> the Catholic church there. By the time we get to the pale horse, political Rome is no more, uh, at least not in the way it was before. But religious Rome or religious political Rome is now um, uh, the symbol of what we call the church at large. And it is terrible. It is a terrible persecutor. And what I always find interesting, I'm leaving this up for a minute for people to screenshot it or to pause it and look up the, the text. But what I find very interesting about this is this history is not hidden. Anyone who wants to know what happened between the white horse 
and the pale horse is all there in the library for anybody who wants to know. And with these cell phones and all of that, we really have no excuse for not knowing, but we have reached a point where people don't think they'll be held accountable for what they don't know. That's where we are. All right. So here's what I find uh, good news in this story is that Jesus told us it was going to happen in Matthew 24. Daniel said it would happen in Daniel 7. We hear it again in Revelation 13 and 12 and 17. But here's the best part about all of it. Jesus plans for these martyrs to be closest to him in his new kingdom. Revelation 7, 13 through, uh, Revelation 7, 13 through 17. All right. Oh, well, poor Mike, his internet is out. Uh, all right. So uh, very interesting, but we're going to circle back. So don't worry. We go, we always, Reve Revelation Seminar just keeps circling back until everybody understands it clearly. So number eight. What did John see and hear under the fifth seal? Revelation chapter six, verses nine and 10. It says, answer, he saw souls slain for the word of God. He heard them cry for God to avenge their blood. Now this could be taken, remember all of this is symbolic. People who have died are dead. They're not somewhere being tortured and and crying and looking for somebody to rescue them, they're dead. But God envisioned, just like he did with Daniel, allowed John to see it like watching TV. He was allowed to see uh, what would happen in the future. That's all that's happening here. These are not people stuck in purgatory somewhere. Uh, he was just allowed to see what would happen in the future. Okay, all right. In the fifth seal, the blood of the martyred saints cried out symbolically to God, like the blood of Abel did after he was slain by his brothers. Good example, Genesis 4.10. Uh, after Abel was dead, his blood didn't literally cry out. What it meant is that God took note of that injustice, and he, he promised to make it right. Did everybody understand that? Okay. Yes, sir. Thank you. It was a terrible time of persecution when true Bible-believing Christians were put to death by the millions for their faith. I, I just, I have to go on because this is really an advanced class statement I'm about to make, but I just find it so interesting that, and rightfully so, that Hitler's name can't be given to any child on this planet for the 6 million Jews that he slayed. But the Catholic Church receives no pushback from the untold millions that were slain under their persecution. Just find that very interesting. Okay. Number nine, how long do they rest before receiving their rewards? Revelation 6, 11. And white robes were given unto every one of them. Answer, for a little season, until their fellow servants also and their brethren should be fulfilled. Now, this is the, uh, you know, people make fun of us about believing that people are in the grave until Jesus comes, but it's a wonderful gift. It, it feels like a moment, a little while, if God simply allows his, his people to rest in the grave until he comes, they don't suffer through anything. Once it's over, it's over until he comes. And then when they awake, uh, all that time that has passed is not counted unto them. They don't realize how much time has passed. So I see it as a wonderful gift. The white robes indicate victory for these martyrs. Revelation 19, 8 and 3, 5. Though their victory was already won, they were to rest or sleep in the tomb a little season till Jesus returns and rewards all his saints together at the same time. Hebrews 11, verses 39 and 40. You see, we don't have to guess. We don't have to go by our feelings. We just need to read the scripture, okay? All right, so here we go. 
The fifth seal covers the same era as the fifth church, Sardis from the 16th to the mid 18th century. So the horrible persecution of the fourth seal continued. You see that word continued, everybody? Continued under the fifth seal. Jesus said this time of persecution will be would be shortened, Matthew 24, 21, and 22. It was drastically shortened and finally stopped by the dynamic preaching of the great preachers of the Reformation. Amen and amen. Signs in the heavens. Number 10. What events take place as the sixth seal opens? Revelation 6, 12, and 13. You can kind of see it with the picture we chose there. Uh, a, a great earthquake. B, the stars fell. C, the moon became as blood. D, the sun became black. Wow. When God made the sun, moon, and stars at creation, he said, let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and for years. How about that? Genesis 1.14. So these great signs appeared in the heavens. And you can go and uh, all the dates of these things are documented. You can go back and research it. I did it just today. The great earthquake of November 1st, 1755. This was the greatest catastrophe the world had seen since Noah's flood. Uh, it was felt over the greatest greater part of Europe, Africa, and America. Can you imagine that? An earthquake that was felt in both Europe, Africa, and America. Since it's centered in Portugal, it is commonly referred to as the Lisbon earthquake. The dark day of May 19th, 1780. 1780. See how precise this is? This caused great alarm, and many thought the end of the world had come. Be beginning in mid-morning, it became so dark that lamps had to be lighted in the houses. The darkness covered a large part of North Africa and caused serious-minded people to study their Bible for an answer. Wow. Can you imagine it being that dark in mid-morning? <laughs> The moon red as blood, May 19th, 1780, about midnight, the unusual darkness lifted and the moon appeared, but it was as blood, red as blood. This represented the closing of an era when a true knowledge of Jesus, the son of righteousness, had been obscured during the dark ages and the blood of millions of true Bible-believing Christians was spilled. Wow. The falling of the stars, November 13th, 1833. Man, we're working toward a date, aren't we? This was an exciting display of heavenly fireworks, perhaps the greatest ever witnessed on the face of the earth. It was seen across North America, and it is estimated that 200,000 stars an hour, let me say that again, 200,000 stars an hour fell over a period of five or six hours. People thought that surely it was the judgment day. So when God's prophetic clock struck, the signs in the heavens appeared. Man, can you imagine that happening today? Number 11, the next great event under the sixth seal is Revelation 6, 14 through 17, the second coming of Christ. Then the wicked will cry, the great day of his wrath is come. Wow. It is sobering indeed to realize that we are now living between verses 13 and 14 of the sixth seal of Revelation 6. The next great sign will be the sudden appearing of Jesus Christ coming in the clouds of glory, Matthew 24 and verse 30. The sixth seal covers the time periods of both the sixth and seventh churches, Philadelphia and Laodicea from about the middle of the 18th century to the coming of Jesus. So somebody asked about when does the pale horse cover? What time period? Well, we started back there in Pergamos, but he's galloping faster now. But if you have the seal of God, you don't have to worry about that. Number 12, who will be able to stand when Jesus returns? Revelation 7, 2, and 3, those who are sealed by God. 
hurt not the earth till we have sealed the servants of God in their foreheads. And we're going to talk a lot about that in our next session. Uh, but uh, we're going to move on past it now. The people who will be ready for Jesus coming must first receive God's seal, a sign in their forehead. Our next seminar lesson explains what this very important sign or seal is and how you may receive it. All right. Number 13, what happens when all have heard the gospel? Revelation 14, 6 and 14. Jesus comes in the clouds. All right. The everlasting gospel and the three angels' messages of Revelation 14, 6 and verse 10 with God's sealing truth is sweeping across the earth like a prairie grass, prairie grass fire in the wind. Get ready for the next lesson. Number 14, how can I know when Jesus will appear? Matthew 24, 33, when you answer, when you see the signs, know that it is near even at the door. Note, it is very exciting to know that the second coming of Jesus is near. However, no man knows the exact day or hour of his return, Matthew 24, 36. The all-important question is, are you ready? What happens when the seventh seal is open? Revelation 8, 1. There was silence in heaven for about the space of a half an hour. This silence takes place at the time of Jesus' coming. Heaven is silent because heaven is empty. Let me say it one more time. I didn't hear nobody shout right there. Heaven is silent because heaven is empty. You are so important to God that he's going to empty heaven to come get you. The Father and all the holy angels will come with Jesus when he returns for his saints. Matthew 16, uh, verse 27. Matthew 25, verse 31. How should we act during the signs of Jesus' return? Luke 21, 28. Look up and lift up your heads, for your redemption draweth nigh. Our most exciting thought should be of our Lord's return. We must make our preparation for this great event first in our lives and tell others so they too may be ready. Hope you enjoy this. How does Jesus feel when we ask for his help? Jude 24 and 25, he will keep you from falling and present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. Oh, yes. No matter who you are or what your past has been, Jesus will accept you if you really want to be saved. He will forgive your sins and help you prepare for his great and glorious coming so you may take that amazing space journey from earth to glory or from earth to heaven. Will you decide now to do whatever Jesus wants you to do? You see down there what to read? Just pause the screen right here. We're closing now because we have another study in about two minutes or one minute. <laughs> so uh, I'm going to pray. This is the last slide. And we hope to meet you in the kingdom, if not before then. Father, thank you for this wonderful lesson tonight. Thank you for opening our eyes and thank you for the lessons to come. May, be, may we all be ready when you come. In Jesus' name, amen.